So our next speaker is Philip Tai, who's an assistant professor at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. Dr. Tai received his bachelor degree in molecular cellular biology from UC Berkeley and his PhD in biochemistry from the University of Washington. He is also the director of the Vector Innovation Discovery and Engineering Program and a faculty of the Lai Weibo Institute of Rare Diseases Research. Uh, his current research focuses on the developmental, the development of next-gen sequencing methodologies to profile AAV vector genome quality, the discovery and characterization of natural AAV capsid isolates for vectorization and gene therapy, and also development of safe and efficacious vectors. Uh, so today he will be presenting on his paper titled The AAV Genome Population Sequencing of Vectors Packaging CRISPR Components Reveals Design Influence Heterogeneity. Uh, and this was published in Molecular Therapy. So with that, please welcome Dr. Tai. Thank you, Nicole. Um, uh, thank you for the introduction. So um, today what I wanted to focus on was um, a simple presentation which shows some data slides uh, coming from our paper that, uh, again, we had published last year by Tam Tran uh, in the lab, a postdoc in the lab. But what I primarily wanted to focus on uh, was um, the overall concepts of using long read sequencing uh, for um, gauging the heterogeneity of AAV, because I think it's, it's one of the underutilized uh, methodologies uh, in the gene therapy field. So although uh, what we had shown was that um, you know, CRISPR components are indeed compatible uh, with AAV uh, gene delivery methods, um, I think uh, what I wanted to do was focus on, on a, a bigger picture. Um, so let me see if I can bring back my arrowhead. There we go. Um, but before I get into the data slides, what I wanted to do was to kind of give a general background about why some of the work that we have been pursuing is so important. Uh, so this is a uh, uh, first few slides uh, that I took from the American Society of Gene and Cell Therapy that uh, summarize some of the current statuses for gene therapy. So currently, there are 16 gene and cell therapies that are approved uh, throughout China, uh, Russia, Europe, US, and Japan. And among these 16, two of them are actually uh, based on adeno-associated viral vectors, uh, which is the platform that, that my research is based on. And these are, of course, Luxterna, uh, which is a treatment for Leber's congenital amaurosis, uh, which is an eye disease. And then the second, uh, which um, uh, it, it, uh, uh, called uh, Zolgensma, uh, uh, treats spinal muscular atrophy, uh, which is a neuromuscular uh, disease. Um, and so within the past few years, uh, I think the gene therapy field has indeed uh, been, uh, been exploding. So here is sort of a histogram uh, illustrating the more than uh, 1,300 uh, gene therapies that are currently in, in development at preclinical stages as well as in, uh, in uh, clinical trials. Uh, so among these, you can see here this little red slice of the, of the stacked histogram. There are about 25 therapies. Uh, that are phase three clinical trial development. Um, and among these uh, gene therapies that are currently under development, a majority of them are based on viral uh, vectors. And so about 88% of these gene therapies are based on viral vectors. And within these subsets of, of uh, therapies, most of them are based on lentiviral uh, uh, platforms as well as at uh, AEV platforms. And so uh, to sort of emphasize the importance of AAV and also to bring along concepts of, of CRISPR-Cas9, which doesn't really need introduction, you know, uh, CRISPR technologies has been in the media, has been in our sort of, um, 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 you know, f uh, in the forefront of, of science um, and, and uh, being able to target disease. Uh, one of the questions that we have continuously so for both gene therapy and gene editing is uh, whether these methodologies are indeed safe. And uh, I like this figure because it, it really does um, uh, highlight some of the key um, historical moments uh, throughout uh, um, um, AV and, and, and gene therapy um, milestones, as well as the development of uh, CRISPR-Cas9 methodologies. So uh, gene therapy is, uh, was, um, is fairly old, if you sort of consider 1990 uh, old. Um, I think I was still in high school. Uh, but the first gene therapy trials that were successfully 
attempted and pursued uh, was gene therapy for ADA SCID. Um, and this was quickly followed up um, with uh, several additional trials. But uh, in 1999, we sort of hit a dark uh, stage in gene therapy where a patient uh, uh, whose name uh, was uh, Jesse Gelsinger, who had ornithine transcarbamylase deficiency, received the adenovirus gene therapy. And he unfortunately passed away due to uh, immunotoxicity. And so at this stage, um, this set the field uh, several years back, but I think uh, what we had learned from this was that number one thing in terms of developing these gene therapies is safety needs to be a priority. So since this time, of course, I'd shown that slide to, to demonstrate that gene therapy methodologies have indeed exploded, and there's uh, definitely a lot of excitement. One of the um, points of excitement is, of course, uh, the development of the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, gene editing platforms. So the, the CRISPR locus was first identified in 1993. Uh, and um, uh, since then, um, you know, it's also met with a roller coaster ride of, 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 uh, of history of, uh, in, in recent times. Of course, in 2017, uh, the first CRISPR germline editing uh, happened in China, again, re-raising the question of safety as well as uh, ethical concerns. Um, but uh, in 19, uh, sorry, in 2019, the first in vivo CRISPR gene therapy was used to target blindness. And there's been a lot of, uh, of uh, media attention uh, and excitement in, in the use of CRISPR to, to treat other diseases like uh, sickle cell anemia. So one of the things that we wanted uh, to ask again was, um, if these platforms are to be combined together, you know whether they're indeed safe, and this was the focal point for our investigation. Uh, but just as a general background about um, what AEV is, AEV uh, is of course um, a a small um, um, a non immunogenic, non pathogenic virus that you can engineer into a recombinant AEV. It's about uh, 25 nanometers in size, and the prevailing thought is that it can bind onto cellular receptors. And then it can enter into cells through endocytosis, through uh, clathrin-coated pits. Then it can get trafficked throughout the cell uh, in, in endosomal compartments. Uh, upon trafficking, uh, the capsid uh, experiences a, a significant drop in pH, whereby uh, that, sorry, that, um, that, that triggers a conformational change in the capsid that allows it to escape uh, lysosomes and late endosomes. Once uh, escaped, uh, it can then shuttle into the nucleus and then uncoat to reveal the, um, the vector uh, genome payload. So conventional AAVs uh, are single strand in nature, um, similar to the wild type composition, uh, but they can also package plus and minus strands of the DNA. So uh, upon entering the nucleus, it needs to be converted into a double stranded um, configuration in order to induce um, um, you know, transcriptional activation, right? Because you need to get uh, double-stranded DNA to do so. Uh, but um, uh, researchers um, have also developed double-stranded uh, DNAs called self-complementary AAVs that upon packaging is already in a double-stranded confirmation. So these type of engineered AAVs can overcome the rate-limiting step of second-strand synthesis. One of the hallmarks of uh, AAV is that uh, once in a double-stranded confirmation, it can then undergo circularization through recombination of the uh, inverted terminal repeat sequences that flank the, the genome on, on both sides. Uh, and these uh, persist in non-dividing cells as stable episomes, which, which give uh, AAV its, its uh, strength and uh, ability to, um, to treat cells and tissues for presumably the lifetime of the patient. Uh, uh, what has been heavily investigated also is uh, AAV's capacity to also integrate into the genome, and this occurs at a very low frequency. So um, when I first entered the AAV uh, field, um, you know, my naive expectation is that, you know, upon designing a vector, uh, any uh, uh, vector uh, um, that is generated uh, should be faithful to the design process. However, uh, because AAV is still currently um, um, generated by cell-based system, uh, there is a lot of error that can occur, right? And you know, we, we, as a field, we're still trying to understand how to limit, um, you know, uh, these errors, right? And these errors can actually come in the form of uh, contaminants as well as um, vector genome heterogeneity. And these can 
uh, contaminating uh, aspects of genomes that can be packaged into AAV, uh, they can come from the uh, plasmids uh, that uh, are required for AAV packaging. Uh, they can come from uh, components of helper uh, plasmid uh, sequences uh, that are also needed during the packaging step. And they can also come from um, uh, genomic fragments um, that are part of the host cell genome. Um, and so in, the reality of the situation is that really AEV is a black box um, in terms of its content. And so as you can imagine, um, you know, if, if a drug were to be developed uh, based on AEV, uh, we really need to come up with methodologies uh, in order to really get, gain a good understanding of what's actually being packaged. So there are several platforms that have been de developed in recent times uh, that aim to query this. Um, uh, many of them are based on Illumina sequencing or the short uh, read sequencing technologies, uh, but we wanted to take a, a, a different approach. Um, so we um, uh, started a collaboration with uh, scientists at PacBio to develop a uh, means of uh, sequencing AAV uh, on a large scale, uh, and we've called this um, methodology AAV genome population sequencing. Um, and uh, this is just an illustration to um, to describe how this general process works. Um, and so, as I had mentioned again, AAV packages both plus and minus strand genomes. And then when DNA is isolated from the particles, they can, uh, they can undergo Watson-Crick base pairing to form these double-stranded uh, DNA uh, configurations. And as I mentioned again, self-complementary AAVs are already in the double-stranded conformation. And so these two species uh, can be adapted uh, either on both ends or just one end of the open-ended molecules. And then these effectively give you a, a single-strand DNA circular uh, DNA template, uh, which is ideal for, of course, um, packed bio sequencing. And so um, as, you, as many of you here know, uh, the material then undergoes strand displacement polymerase activity, uh, to, to, uh, which is essentially rolling circle amplification. Uh, and these uh, continuous reads, uh, you, we can then separate the individual plus and minus strands to obtain strand-specific consensus, uh, consensus sequences. Because uh, as I mentioned before, um, you may get heterogeneous um, annealing where the top strand may be different from the bottom strand. So the top and the minus and plus strands uh, can be treated as independent um, uh, vector genome species. And so um, we had demonstrated that this platform works fairly well uh, in our first um, um, uh, description of the methodology in, in 2017, also uh, published in Molecular Therapy. Uh, but what we found, um, and actually we had developed the methodology to address a very basic question, which is that um, constructs that carried silencing RNA uh, cassettes for gene therapy tended to result in low um, transduction efficiency and low potency uh, when, when uh, delivered into animals. And when you isolate DNA and run this out in a gel, what you get are multiple bands. And so this top band uh, should be the full length uh, genomic uh, composition. However, what you see is multiple bands and actually the majority of these uh, species represent something that's uh, about 1.7 kb in size. And so uh, in order to investigate what these compositions could be, we, we uh, developed this methodology. And uh, this is just a sort of simple cartoon of the vector here with the promoter that drives the expression of the EGFP reporter, as well as the silencing RNA. Uh, and what we saw was that uh, certain key positions within the construct led to a high degree of um, of truncation hotspots, right? So this peak shows that about 13-14% uh, of the of the truncation events occur at this position, uh, and, and a much lower uh, percentage actually uh, represented full length from, from ITR to ITR. Uh, but what we also saw was that there are multiple regions, um, you know, uh, within the, the sequence that also led to uh, truncation events. Um, and uh, what what we were able to show was that these uh, are due to uh, high secondary structure. So the next sort of thing that we wanted to ask was, of course, we had also been developing uh, um, gene therapy constructs based on CRISPR-Cas9. And we know that uh, the, one of the uh, components for Cas9 is uh, the uh, single guide RNAs, which also form these hairpins, which could confer some uh, secondary structure, which may uh, reveal 
uh, vector heterogeneity. So uh, what we had um, uh, pursued was to query uh, three individual constructs which carry different uh, configurations of uh, cast nine components and the guide in the guide RNA uh, sequence. And so this top one is is a all in one construct that carries uh, SA Cas9 as well as a, a, a single guide RNA driven by uh, human uh, uh, U6 promoter. The second one is actually a very interesting construct where we had designed uh, the U6 uh, two U6 uh, driven uh, guide RNAs that were in a tail to tail configuration. And as you can imagine, this may form a very strong secondary structure because it's it's essentially an inverted uh, palindromic sequence. The other construct is uh, uh, another uh, double guide, um, uh, a dual guide construct, uh, which are in a unidirectional uh, configuration. And when we ran these sequences out, lo and behold, we find that the top and the bottom constructs lead to very homogeneous uh, and, 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 and intense bands uh, representing uh, full length uh, configurations, whereas the one in the middle here uh, that contains this uh, tail to tail uh, configuration leads to multiple species. And we, we predict that this is probably not going to be very potent when delivered to animals. And so um, upon uh, sequencing by pack bile, this is sort of what we saw. And this is probably familiar uh, to many of you in, in, in the audience. This is simply just the IGV display uh, demonstrating um, the, uh, the, the reads aligned to the vector genome. And so uh, reads that are completely uh, um, identical to the reference are in gray, and then the bits that are you know, in, in these speckles represent gaps, and then sequences uh, that are different in base pair composition are in different colors. Uh, if you display these with, um, with soft clipping on, then you get uh, some of these uh, interesting uh, colored portions of uh, individual reads here, which represent um, um, either truncation events or, um, or uh, recombined genomes. And so what this is representing here uh, through this bottom graph, which, which shows uh, read counts as distributed by uh, read length, is that majority of these sequences are indeed from ITR to ITR, they're full length. But we do see a small degree of these uh, sequences uh, truncated, which map perfectly with a single guide RNA. So although they do cause a very small degree of truncations, the outcomes are very, very minor. And so what we saw with the second construct uh, with the head to tail confirmation, we see that all of the reads basically are, uh, are shorter, they're all truncated, and they form at the junction at which the uh, tail to tail um, uh, configured uh, guide RNA sequences uh, lie. And so what this confirms is that this type of design causes a large degree of, of uh, truncated genomes. Uh, while constructs uh, that, are, that have the guide RNA uh, configured in a unidirectional configuration, um, we see a majority of them are full length. Uh, one of the bizarre things that we saw for our self-complementary genomes, which are depicted at the top here, uh, these are the expected uh, reads. We also see uh, a, 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 a representative population that is single strand in nature. Um, but one of the things that uh, the using uh, long read sequencing reveals is the fact that we get uh, recombination events um, that are critical, right? So uh, one of the things that we found in one of our earlier investigations is that AEV can generate these chimerics, right? And these can uh, carry sequences that map to the human genome, uh, sequences that, that map to the plasmids that, that make up these uh, constructs. And so uh, these are, um, are, are, are critical because now um, these contaminants um, potentially have a mechanism of driving uh, packaging into AAV. And this is just a graph, a uh, supplementary figure that we had included in, in, into one of our investigation where we use the Express 2.0 AT ligation kit uh, with a um, spike in sample that was digested by four base pair cutters to, dem to demonstrate that none of these spike in materials uh, actually um, ligated to AAV genomes. So all of the genomes that we see uh, that share um, uh, aspects of mapping to the human genome are indeed real, right, uh, and represent chimeric genomes. And so uh, this is my last data slide, just to show that uh, within the uh, construct that, that bore this SA-Cas9 uh, single guide uh, vector, that we also see these chimeric genomes. And what's interesting is that all of these chimeric genomes are anchored by the 3' UTR, uh, suggesting that 
um, not only are they contaminants, but they have, again, a mechanism uh, for becoming packaged into vectors. And if you, uh, and if you um, consider that there is a low degree uh, integration of AEV into cells that they transduce, this may be a huge problem because if you, if you uh, recombine with some sequence that could be a potential uh, oncogene or have some uh, sequencing elements that could drive a promoter activity, then this is definitely something to be a concern. So further work needs to be done in order to explore the extent to which these contaminating genomes can impact gene therapy. And um, I hope, I'm a very strong advocate of, again, using uh, uh, this, um, these long read sequencing tools like PacBio uh, in order to explore these things. And so I, I wanted to end with a slide acknowledgement. I wanted to thank members of the Gal Lab, uh, Tam Tran, the, again, the postdoc, the first author on this paper, the vector core that generated the vectors that we used in the lab, uh, the sequencing core here at UMass led by Maria Zapp and uh, D Daniela Wilmot. Um, they were essential in, in getting uh, the project uh, kick-started. And I wanted to thank the team at PAC uh, Bio, especially uh, Christina Weber, uh, Matthew Seaton. Uh, and also, um, I don't know why they got cut off here, but Shell Heiner and, and Mike uh, Wyand were essential um, players in getting this project uh, kick started. What I didn't get to talk about was some of the work that we've been collaborating with uh, at the University of Danant, uh, a project uh, led by Magli Panad Budlu, uh, which uh, focuses on um, on uh, vector heterogeneity in different in different packaging platforms. Uh, uh, so that with that, I'll, um, I'll I'll end my my, my talk. So, Phil, based on your findings, are AAV gene therapy vectors safe? Yeah, so that's a very good question, and it's it's always an ongoing debate about well, not debate, but but active discussion that's healthy, right? Um, and knowing that you know there are current uh, you know gene therapies uh, that have been approved, um, and there are ongoing clinical trials for the vast majority of vector platforms, they are safe. Now. You know, in recent times, there have been some adverse effects uh, that that patients have um, have undergone in certain gene therapy trials uh, that are due to high dose of AEVs, and so people now are are really trying to get at what could be the cause for these adverse effects. You know, whether they're due to immunological response or whether they're due to you know some sort of genotoxic response. But I think these type of methodologies uh, um, that uh, will continue to grow are necessary in order to evaluate, you know, what people are getting dosed with. Absolutely. And we have a couple more people join the room. So just quickly, um, there's a couple different ways to ask questions. You can put a question into the room chat. Um, also, if you would like to go live and ask the question to Phil, um, if you follow the instructions on the slide, I can actually bring you on camera. Um, so another question is, can other biovectors be sequenced by PacBio? Yeah, I think so. Um, and I haven't really seen any um, investigations that use um, PacBio uh, platform to sequence other viral vectors um, like lentiviruses and, and adenoviruses. Um, adenovirus certainly you can because it's it's a DNA virus, but lentivirus uh, because they're they're RNA based, they they may be a little bit more uh, challenging. Uh, but you know, I, I think I, I definitely look forward to. Uh, seeing how those uh, platforms are developed. One thing about lentiviruses are they are typically uh, used for cell-based therapy uh, engineering, right? So all the CAR T cells that have been developed are based on lentiviral vectors. And obviously, uh, you know, you can, you can transduce cells and then screen individual cell clones. So there is an immediate uh, means of... Um, double checking, you know, whether the editing events that you've engineered into the cell are are going to uh, be efficacious, right? The problem with AAVs is that you directly inject the AAV into the body in a, in a uh, you know, in an in vivo methodology, and there's always some, some risks uh, there, right? So this is what um, uh, the, these platforms were developed for. Absolutely. 
So we have a question from Rachel and she's asking for AEV, do you happen to see more truncation events with a specific production method and or with different genome construct designs? Like single stranded versus self complementary, full length versus overstuffed versus half size? Yeah, that's a very good question. And so, um, you know, we haven't sequenced every combination of production method and every vector platform that exists. Uh, but we have been exploring um, uh, uh, vectors that have been produced by BEV SF9 systems. So these are the baculovirus insect cell um, platforms. Uh, and I, I it's hard for me to say that, you know, some platforms uh, lead to more truncations uh, because I think there is a huge design aspect to it. But I will say that the types of truncations that are generated by uh, the BEV uh, insect cell model are different than the HEK platforms. Um, and we are um, drafting a manuscript to describe some of these uh, differences that are fundamental between these packaging platforms. Uh, yeah, he asks, are most contamination sequences from plasmids? Um, so, so for certain vectors that we've sequenced, uh, a fair amount of them do come from the plasmids. Um, so anywhere between, you know, uh, five to 20% uh, may come from plasmid. Uh, genomic sequences, you know, also have a range as well. Um, Great, thank you, Phil. Um, let's see. Um, so we have another question from the previous um, talk. Are are the stand are there standards for genome heterogeneity established by the FDA? Uh, no. So that's again. I think this is a very good question. So thus far, as um, there there are no standards for FDA um, thresholds for you know heterogeneity and and contaminating genomes. Right. Well, actually, I take that back. So. Um, before right, uh, the use of NGS, one means of detecting contaminating uh, sequences is just by conventional PCR, right? So I think the, the, the sort of loose interpretation of their rules is that, you know, as long as contaminating genomes uh, is, you know, under some percentage, let's say 5% or 10%, uh, then uh, the gene therapy uh, um, vectors are deemed quote unquote safe, right? And typically what they will screen for are, are things like, you know, ampicillin resistance genes that are part of the uh, plasmid backbone, right? But that has nothing to, to, to say about uh, vector heterogeneity in the form of truncations. I think with the PacBio platform, we are first beginning to get a sense for, for what these genomes look like, right? Because even if you use something like NGS, uh, based on Illumina um, short fragment sequences, um, you can get recoverage across the vector genome and you can come up with some quantitative measure for, for the abundance of reads that map to your gene versus reads that map to the, to the host cell genome and to those that map uh, uniquely to the plasmid. Uh, but you're never going to get a good indication for you know, uh, the presence of chimeric genomes and uh, and, and, and full length genomes as a percentage of, of composition within packaged AAV. Absolutely. And, you know, it seems like this is an area that's moving faster than regulations are coming about. Um, do you kind of have a sense of, you know, how this is all going to come to head or what is going to start being required by the FDA? Yeah, I think it's a trade-off, right? Because especially many of the trials are being done in very small populations, right? Like single patient uh, populations. And uh, gene therapy has been um, focused on, you know, monogenic diseases where the population is uh, uh, part of this rare disease community, right? So it's not like, you know, there's a lot of flexibility to say, okay, um, you know, we're going to exhaustively uh, uh, test, you know, how these contaminating genomes uh, can impact uh, people. Um, most patients are so desperate for uh, these gene therapies just for the hope and, and the chance of being able to survive. So many of these monogenic diseases, uh, life expectancy mm -hmm. doesn't go beyond uh, childhood, 
right? And so, you know, there are definitely risks involved. And so um, I think as the field matures and as uh, more and more people recognize, um, you know, whether this high dose uh, toxicity that people are now seeing has anything to do with heter heterogeneic material within packaged genomes. I think uh, all of those things will come to light and, and you know, these tools uh, will, in my opinion, will be invaluable. Absolutely. And Tim, I see you have another question. Uh, we figured it out. If you do still want to come live, um, if you could just click on your microphone and camera, um, that will actually allow me to bring you live. Um, and the next question is from him is typically how many VG fools are required for PacBio? Um, typically, we, uh, we will process in our established pipeline anywhere from uh, E11 to E12 but we will only use a small portion of that for the actual sequencing uh, because we also run things like alkaline gels in order to confirm that the populations that we're seeing um, are also represented in PacBio. So um, I, I know that now there's some companies that have started to offer these things and they ask for 1E13, which is a lot of uh, AV. And if this is for research purposes, not a lot of uh, labs have resources to to give up that amount, you know, th that amount of a uh, vector is is usually can can treat hundreds of mice, right? <laughs> so, yeah. um, um, so uh, we typically um, um, will underload uh, our flow cells uh, um, to the extreme, right? Because uh, we know that the material is very very expensive, um, and what we'll do is uh, spike in. Uh, with lambda phase DNA. So this is part of our pipeline, right? And that serves as a means of controlling for um, uh, um, loading bias for smaller molecules. And at the same time, it, it, it serves as kind of like a, um, um, you know, additional material uh, that'll um, boost recount, right? Yeah. And so that's kind of a good question that I have. Um, I know a lot of your earlier work, you know, was done on the SQL instrument and with the higher throughput of the SQL too. Um, have you really been able to kind of push the boundaries of how many samples you're multiplexing on a single run? Um, so that's my first question. The second one is typically how many reads per sample do you need to see um, to be able to really validate that? Factor? Yeah. Yeah, that's also a good question. It so it really depends on the project, right? So if if the goal is to just look at uh, representative genomes to assess, you know, what's the what's the percentage of truncated events, you know, you don't really need that much uh, reads, right? So even when we started with RS two, uh, we would run just one vector sample on a single flow cell, and we'll get you know twenty thousand reads, right? Which is mm -hmm. which is <laughs> Very, very little, right? Uh, but now that the technology with the SQL two is much better, we can we can definitely uh, multiplex uh, multiple samples. So the most I feel comfortable with is about ten to twelve uh, vector samples per per run. Uh, but if the if the project is to assess contaminating genomes, right, looking for a needle in a haystack, then you know we would recommend just running a single vector. Uh, uh, genome on a on a single flow cell to boost the amount of representative reads, right? Absolutely, and it's kind of hard to know what percentage that contaminant is going to be at, so it's best to get as many reads as possible. Right, 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 right. Awesome. So we're about at the time. We're a little bit over. Um, I know we have a little bit of flexibility, so if there's any more questions, we're happy to hang around for a little bit longer. If you guys want to come live or put them into the chat function. Sure. Yeah. Or Phil, if you had any last thoughts um, to share with the group, happy yeah, to do that um, as well. Yeah, so, I've, I'm, uh, so I was um, primarily uh, trained uh, in the AEV field uh, by, by Guangping Gao uh, here at UMass. And so of uh, recent times, I've started to uh, grow my own group. Um, and, uh, you know, we do seek, uh, you know, um, very knowledgeable, very skilled, you know, bioinformaticians and, and people that are familiar with this uh, field, because I think, again, it is an underutilized tool. 
and not a lot of gene therapy people, you know, trained in trained in uh, doing this type of work, uh, have a good appreciation or can actually execute the the methodologies. You know, you can bring in a great bioinformatician, but the the most difficult part is to to teach them about AAV, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the problem with, of course, learning bioinformatics is that you know it's near impossible for someone who's been training as a virologist for ten years, right? So, um, you know. We we're always looking to 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 bring on people that are very highly skilled and 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 are interested in this type of work, and we're also uh, welcome to collaboration as well. So, awesome! Yeah, no, that's that's really great to hear. Well, I have not seen any more questions come in. So again, I just want to thank you, Phil, so much for doing this presentation for us. Um, it was really awesome to hear about your latest work. And as Nikki said, can't wait to see what you come out with next. And thank you also, everyone, for joining. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye.